Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to a very special edition of No Vacancy Live here with Anthony Melchiori and myself, Glenn Hausman. We thought it was extremely crucial to keep you updated on the health of the nation. What exactly is happening with COVID-19? That's why we've had on Dr. Ronald Primus with us in the past. And that's why today we're going to be talking with Dr. Michael Osterholm. Isn't that right, Anthony? That's right. And it's not about the headlines. It's about the real information. So we're going to get it from a person that does this for a living every single day. So right. why, why don't you tell us about him? I'm gonna. So you may have seen Dr. Osterholm on places like The View, CNN, Meet the Press with Chuck Todd, lots of great news sources out there. But so you know who he is. He's a Regents Professor, McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in Public Health, the Director of Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, and a professor. I could go on and on and on with this guy's credentials. Plus, he's the author of the New York Times bestselling 2017 book, Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs, where he details the most pressing infectious disease threats of our day, and also lays out a nine-point strategy on how to address all of those things. So very important individual to have with us today. So without further ado, let's bring in Mr. Dr. Michael Osterholm. Hello, sir, and welcome uh, so much. We really well, appreciate you. you being here today. It's good, to be, good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Anthony, you want to ask the first question, sir? Basically, what I want to know, first of all, thank you so much. It's, a, it's an honor to have you on. We're very excited to have you on. Why is this strain so um complicated why does it get a hold of some people and just terrorize them whereas other um infectious disease and other strains aren't as bad what what is it about this one yeah well in this world of modern medical science you would think that we have all these answers right at the tip of our fingers mm -hmm. and in fact we're going to be studying this virus for many many years to come in terms of what it does to us and how it does it uh, it reminds me uh, what happened in the early 1980s when we first discovered HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, that literally ca caused a whole new area of study in the issue of infectious diseases and what our immune system is like. This virus uh, is doing even much more than that. It Im impacts not only our immune systems, but our hearts, our lungs, our um, just neurologic systems, et cetera. And on top of that, as you just pointed out, uh, we don't understand why some people are very likely to have no disease at all with their infection. Some become seriously ill and die. And now a third category are those who uh, fit into what we call a long haulers group, a group that initially has relatively mild illness, um, not hospitalized. Uh, some could be hospitalized. But more often what happens is by month three or four following their infection, they still are largely unable to go back to normal life. Uh, they're at home, a chronic fatigue syndrome-like picture. Some of them have a pretty nasty looking chest uh, x-rays, uh, having hard times breathing. They still need oxygen, even at home. Uh, and so this virus reach into the human uh, body is remarkable. And uh, we've got a lot more to learn about it. And uh, I sometimes say when I come on shows like this, I do have one disclosure everyone needs mm -hmm. to know. And that is I probably know less about this disease today than I did 10 weeks ago. Wow. And the more we learn, the more complicated it gets. All right. So uh, one of the things that is really surprising to others, and I think is creating the sense of confusion amongst the, uh, the, the global public, is that some people can have zero symptoms, other people it could be debilitating, and others can die from it. Why is it that people in the same family, I might get very sick, whereas my spouse might have, any, have hardly any symptoms at all? You know, we don't understand that other than to say that we do realize that age, being a male, having underlying risk factors such as cardiovascular disease, heart disease, uh, having issues, renal disease or kidney disease, uh, possibly certain cancers, particularly in the bloodstream, uh, all are risk factors. And a, a major one that most people don't uh, think about is body mass index or being overweight. Mm. Uh, pick the young, un, younger individuals today, that is often the number one risk factor for uh, having very serious disease and even dying. So there are clearly those risk factors. When we look at children, it's a, a different picture. We actually see a different manifestation there where they develop a disease called Kawasaki syndrome, uh, which was one of really of an immune response where basically the inside of your vessels uh, become very, very inflamed because of the virus and, not, and often occurring weeks after your initial infection. And so um, it, it really varies a great deal across the ages, uh, across the genders, 
and across a number of different risk factors in terms of what your outcome might be. Now, having said that, I just want to be clear, and this is, I think, I can't get this message out uh, any more loudly uh, than this, is that today we have many, many young, healthy adults who feel like, ah, this is not a big deal. You know, don't worry about it. Look at our college campuses right now. They're on fire. And yet some of them do become seriously ill and die. And more importantly, we're seeing more and more of them developing this kind of long haulers condition I just mentioned, mm -hmm. where uh, two, three months in, they're not doing real well. So, so we have to emphasize that even for those who appear to have been at the lowest risk of serious disease, there still is a real problem. So you mentioned universities. Where are we? Should universities have a mix online and in class as long as there's social distancing and masks? If you were in charge of a university, would you have just online? What, what do you think is the best solution? And what is your university doing going forward? Yeah. Our university is actually largely online. Over 70% of the courses are online, but some are actually being taught in classrooms uh, by willing professors. Uh, and after a great deal of efforts have been made to distance people out so that the rooms are not the standard old classrooms. Uh, and there are many students who want to come on campus and uh, their parents want them to come. And so the university is trying to adjust to that. Uh, first and foremost, the both uh, student and faculty health is very important to us. Uh, there's testing going on, there's contact tracing, there's quarantining of individuals and trying to overlay all that on a quote unquote college experience. Now, I, for one, have said uh, from the get-go that this is our COVID year. Just expect that. I don't care if you're talking about going to school, if you're in business, if you're in the travel industry, you want to go somewhere. Uh, this is a COVID year. I, uh, before March, was a 200,000 mile a year flyer. I haven't flown since early March. Wow. Uh, I mean, that's a big change. And so I think that this is a COVID year that we just need to get through. We need to get safe and effective vaccines and hope that they will continue to protect us down the road and then uh, go on from there. What is the most uh, current thinking when it comes to, one of our, our guests just asked us, what's the most current medical thinking on how long uh, the virus can live on surfaces? surfaces? It's short. You know, we've had so much what I would basically call a hygiene theater, you know, where basically <laughs> people have uh, made it seem as if, oh my, it brings on the surface. Um, you know, the, we, the data today are surely compelling that uh, s environmental surfaces play almost no role at all in the transmission. Uh, we, we make people feel better by cleaning off surfaces, by washing hands. And now as an infectious disease epidemiologist who deals with a lot of other infectious diseases, you know, good hand washing is next to godliness. So I don't want people not to wash their hands, but understand that this is not the major way transmission is occurring. It is largely through swapping air with people. And that's the challenge we have today, particularly as we go into the fall season here in the Northern Hemisphere uh, with our, our winter time heating. We're going to see more and more people indoors, swapping air in close settings. That's the challenge. So that, that, that leads me to my next question. The challenge here in New York City, the uh, restaurants are still closed. In New Jersey, they just opened some for today, today for 25 percent capacity. Um, rightfully so, the restaurant tours are up in arms they're losing they're losing their businesses they're losing their livelihood so i understand from their perspective but also is it very dangerous to open restaurants right now you know this is a challenge that we have is uh one is understanding what can we do to reduce the risk of this virus so that we hopefully can have as many people as possible actually acquire their immunity not through natural disease but through a vaccine mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is basically delay as many cases until hopefully you know late this year, early next year, and then let people get their immunity that way. Uh, so in the process, what can we do to, uh, to minimize cases? Well, there's different risk groups. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, if you're working in a very close setting, like meat packing plants, or uh, you're working potentially in what are called essential workers, sales mm -hmm. courts, et cetera, you know, that puts you at increased risk in terms of being exposed. One of the areas that we've seen major transmission in is particularly young adults in bars and restaurants. In those states that have opened back up uh, and, and, and seen the influx of the younger population, uh, we have lots of outbreaks. Here in our own state of Minnesota, which is about a house on fire right now, we're in very serious shape in the upper Midwest, Iowa, Minnesota, the Dakotas, 
uh, Nebraska, Nebraska, Kansas, et cetera. This is, a, this is a tough area. We're very similar in case numbers as to where Georgia, Texas, Florida, and California were about eight weeks ago. So this is really concerning. If we look and see what's happened there, clearly bars and restaurants have been a major problem in terms of transmission. We have at least 50 some plus outbreaks here in Minnesota, just in bars. And wow. so this has been, and then because why? Because people sit there and they talk to each other. Of course. You know, it's loud, they're talking loudly, and that just puts more virus out there. So this is a challenge. I think that the point that uh, some of us have raised from the get-go is, is that in shutting these locations down, we need to actually compensate them for that as part of a public health measure. And if there were ever a time to keep our economy going and to support uh, you know, the economy, it's to help support these individuals who have been laid off or businesses who are, are hurting badly because they too have been closed or reduced service. That is something that we uh, we are big proponents of here on, on No Vacancy Live every day. But doctor, I'm curious. The, this seems to be a, a problem amongst young people not understanding the full um, situation that we're in. A lot of it has to do with the fact that before age 25, your brain isn't fully developed. And I think that's why teenagers, such as the ones that I have over here, feel like they're immortal. So to me, that might be one of the biggest problems we have to combat. How can we get folks that simply don't understand to really understand what you're telling us here right now? You know, if you and I can solve that, we probably deserve a Nobel Prize <laughs> right. for something. I'm not sure what, but we deserve it for something. That's a challenge. Uh, we understand that. Uh, you know, some of the uh, most tragic moments I have uh, understood and shared in this whole pandemic has been, for example, uh, kids coming home for Father's Day uh, with their aging fathers or grandfathers hmm. and not realizing they were infected, transmitting the virus to them. And now they, those parents are dead. Hey. Um, you know, this is horrible. And so one of the things that we have to try to keep getting across to these young, younger adults is that in fact, you don't just put yourself at risk. You put others at risk. It's just like drunk driving, you know, yep. you put yourself at risk, but you're putting a lot of other lives at risk too. So, you know, just because you're 21 doesn't mean we don't think you can understand that or that you can't act out an appropriate way so you don't drive drunk. We need to help them understand that the consequences of this virus infection are real for them. Uh, grant you not the same way as if you infect your 67 year old grandfather, but it's real and you still run the risk of transmitting to these other people in your work setting, your school setting, wherever it is. So please understand why this is so important. Look what's happening in these college campuses. I mean, as it's been described by so many people in colleges today, uh, you know, this is like Mardi Gras all over the mm -hmm. country right now. And so this is a huge challenge. And it's one of the things that's really fueling the epidemic as we know it right now is just that. Yeah, absolutely. So I do want to switch and talk a little bit about the situation with vaccines. Now, uh -huh. yep. I've been talking to um, CEOs of public companies behind the scenes, and we're looking not to bring politics into this, but an October surprise might be a vaccine. What does that really mean? Is this really a solution? How do trials work? What is that process like? And what are the realistic expectations that we should all be thinking about as opposed to what we might be hearing on various news sources out there? Thank, well, thank you. Let me just begin by saying I'm glad we have three more hours to discuss this. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you need, uh, sir. Yeah, this is, this is well, a long well, doctor. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, uh, you know, what has happened with vaccines on a global level are simply remarkable. Uh, what we've done in the past uh, six months is what has taken past vaccine research and development years. Right. And I must say that it's been done without shortcuts. Uh, what they did is they just figured out basically how to get about eight more hours in the day. And so rather than uh, doing things one after another, they did them in parallel. And of course, if one of the two parallels didn't work, then they lost the money doing the other thing in parallel. And so there really was a lot of risk taken at, at trying to find right results, not risk and safety, but right results. And so I think we are going to have vaccines uh, that might be approved by the end of this year, early next year. Uh, but it's going to take at least that long. Uh, and, and look at it this way. You know, I was born and raised in rural Iowa. And imagine the Iowa farmer that decides, uh, you know, I'm going to take half the summer off. So I'm going to plant twice as many acres in April mm -hmm. and I'll harvest it in July instead of October. 
And, you know, it makes sense, right? No, it doesn't. You know, it still takes time to do some of this research in terms of looking at safety and effectiveness. And so I, I don't think that we're going to have data at all in October that will allow us to have an October surprise. I'm more confident today than I was even a few days ago that I don't think that there will be an October surprise, even though some may want that, mm -hmm. because the leaders of the vaccine research have made it very clear it's not likely that's going to happen. But also the CEOs of the companies that are actually doing this work have made it very clear that they too do not want to come forward prematurely and risk the whole company on some safety issue right. or lack of effectiveness issue. And uh, I've also, uh, in having conversations with the senior leadership at the FDA, although they've had a, a somewhat jagged track record over the past six months with other aspects of approving things early for uh, uh, the treatment of COVID, I am convinced that they will not too allow a vaccine to come out sooner uh, than is ready to come out. So I can't say that there still couldn't be an October surprise, right. but I'm more doubtful that all the time. So, so let, we're, we're, sorry, Anthony, please, please ask. Oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll follow up. After all right. You. So what I'm thinking is let's say for all intents and purposes that tomorrow the perfect vaccine is announced. That doesn't mean the day after tomorrow, we're all going to our local, uh, our local pharmacy and getting vaccinated for this. Right. Right. What, how uh, we're talking billions of people around the world here. What is that realistically going to look like? Because a lot of us in our business are wishfully thinking the announcement of the vaccine is the finish line when it seems to me that's right. just the starting gun. Yeah, there are several very important aspects to this. And you ask a very, very important question. Thank you. Number one, once the vaccine is approved, uh, under normal conditions, the companies would gear up and start to manufacturing the vaccine. What's happened already are the companies that have been in the competition for the vaccine or vaccines, and I really do believe there'll be multiple ones that have been approved. Um, they've already started producing the vaccine with the idea that if they get approved, it's ready to go. Hmm. Uh, now, if they don't get approved, that's a huge loss again because it's all been wasted. So that's kind of the, the, the efforts that have been made to, to take time out of this process. But then who gets the vaccine? And right now there is... Uh, at work going on here in this country uh, with the National Academy of Sciences, an independent science organization of, of absolutely the highest reputation and respect, actually have just come out with guidelines for what they think should be the prioritization. And their first and foremost has been healthcare workers and first responders who are on the front lines. Right. We need these people. We can't let them go down because they're the ones taking care of us. Then we get into the people at higher risk. Uh, for having serious disease and also essential workers. And then it goes down to the fourth tier, which is virtually everybody. And so there will be an effort to try to, to prioritize the vaccine. Already there's work going on uh, with federal government and the private sector who already now distribute vaccines for our everyday childhood immunizations to establish the kind of, of, of lines of, of activity so that we have uh, adequate supply chains of vaccine moving through to the right people at the right time, getting in the arm. As we all know, a vaccine is just a vaccine. It's nothing until it becomes a vaccination. So your point's a good one. I think that that surely is being addressed right now. Uh, the one challenge I would also add, though, is that this is likely going to be a two-dose vaccine. So that you mm. will get some protection with the first dose, but you're going to require two doses, which means that you have to make that much more vaccine to vaccinate the population. What's and the reason about, behind that? Sorry. Pardon? What is the reason that you would need two? Does the, like, the antibodies yeah. start to build and then the body reacts to it more meaningfully the second time? Right. The first one is kind of like the wake-up call. The second one is, okay, let's really get with it. And so the second one really is important in terms of getting the higher levels of immune response, whether it be antibody or a thing we call T cells. And so this really is going to be a part of the region. Regime Now, I can't say for a fact that it'll be two doses, but I think all the data right now would support it'll be a right. two-dose regimen. What would be the difference in the time from the first dose to the second dose? How uh, you know, it's unclear at this point, probably at least 30 days, somewhere in that time period before you would then get the second dose, which then would mean, you know, your protection would obviously be already kicking in after your first one, but you'd get much better protection after the second one. So, you know, within 40 days, you should start seeing some real protection. Now, the one challenge I want to throw in here, uh, which is always uh, beyond a wet blanket, 
uh, and that is we're still trying to understand immunity to this virus. Mm -hmm. uh, we know from other coronaviruses that immunity sometimes can be short-lived. And you may have heard over the course of the past uh, uh, several weeks that we've now had a series of cases that have been clearly documented to have been reinfected, meaning they got infected once and a time period went by and they got reinfected again with a different uh, strain of the virus. And so that we know for a fact that this was really new infections. And what we don't understand yet is how's that going to play out with regard to vaccines? So this is still a question to be answered. Uh, this is part of what I said to you when we first started this interview. You know, we're learning about this every day right. and uh, we got a lot more to learn. And can you explain to our audience and to, our, to us the difference between the first stage, second stage, now we're in the third stage in some vaccines, and what happens after the third stage normally and what's going to happen now because everybody's fast-tracking this? Yeah. People seem to yeah. be confused about that. Right, and we call these phases. Phase one and two really are about, first of all, just making sure that if you use this vaccine, you get some kind of an immune response, most often done in animals and can be in some very limited number of humans. If you put this into people and you don't get any response out of it, obviously you want to stop right there. Second phase is an increased number of individuals, usually healthy adults, uh, in which you're looking in, the, in terms here of, of, again, confirming that response that you saw in the initial uh, research, but also starting to look for more safety issues. If you look at different doses, do I do give it a one or a three or a five dose, uh, meaning the level of, uh, of the uh, antigen in the, in the vaccine or the thing that elicits the immune response? Uh, so kind of a lot, low, moderate, high dose. And that's what was done here in the original phase two. Phase three is much larger. And in phase three, you're expanding now often to 30,000 or more people that are part of the study. And part of the group gets the virus vaccine. Part of the group gets a placebo or an inert substance mm -hmm. uh, that basically shouldn't protect you at all. And no one knows that except the uh, people in the study, uh, what we basically uh, behind the scenes, you might say, and they're constantly monitoring who gets infected and who doesn't between the two. And the monitoring board would stop a study immediately if they found one, either safety issues or two, that they found that it was working. And they would then say, oh, we got enough data here to say it's working. That's where some people thought this October surprise might come mm -hmm. is we'd have data early enough. But I think that there's enough information right now to say I don't think that's the likelihood. Right. One of the problems that I am seeing out there that's causing friction with between the so-called polit uh, the political sides out there is what you've gone to a couple of times. We're learning about the vaccine over time. And I think people are confusing the natural organic learning process with people changing their minds and playing politics. Could you just be very clear about um, how we learn about things as we go and why that might be affecting people's perceptions about what's happening yeah. out there? Well, we have to understand from the get-go that we have a growing body of our population that doesn't believe in vaccines to begin with. Right. They think they're dangerous. It's the anti-vaccine group. So this is a challenge. The second thing is right now you've got overlaid a history of the FDA of approving certain tests for COVID-19, uh, the oxy or the uh, hydro uh, chloroquine issue. Uh, and you've got all the issues around the plasma therapy. Was that enough alone? Right. And so when you look at something like hydroxychloroquine and you realize, oh my, you know, how did that get approved to begin with? Well, it was because people in the White House wanted it approved. And I think that the challenge has been is, well, this will transfer over to the vaccine. FDA has made some mistakes in that regard, I believe, but I also believe that they've learned from them. And the senior scientists at the FDA are people who have been there for a number of administrations. Hmm. They are really, really solid scientists. And I believe at this point that if a vaccine were to come uh, up for approval or recommendation for use under a, a rubric we call emergency use authorization, that they would stand up and say no. And, uh, you know, we need to have enough safety and, and uh, effectiveness data. Remember, effectiveness data can only be obtained by vaccinating people and then waiting to see if they get exposed to the virus. Right. And so if they don't get exposed to the virus, you learn nothing about the vaccine until you start to see, uh, you know, infections in the placebo group and none in the vaccine group. 
And so part of it's going to be, are we going to have enough infections in the country? Well, we do. In fact, mm -hmm. there's a, a new arm of the study opening in Minnesota right now just because we're seeing so many cases, which actually is a bad thing for us now, but it's a good thing for the design of the study because it will allow us more quickly to learn, did people get protected who really had the vaccine versus the placebo? So if you were yet, say we have a vaccine and say it's a vaccination by first quarter, what does this time next year look like for the country, for people getting back to work, for concerts, for, you know, things starting to get normal? I just drove through New York City this morning, and yeah. it, it looked like a city that was a lot more robust than most people are saying it is. And, and considering that it's the, the long weekend, there's not that many people in the city. However, it still has a sense in some blocks and some areas that it's just holding on. Um, yeah. Where do we look? Where would it look like in a year? Unfortunately, a lot of places are just holding on. And I think we all can agree uh, this lack of action right now out of Washington, D.C. to help so many individuals, essential type workers, people in live entertainment, the restaurant, uh, bar business, I can go on the list, who have been really hurt. We should be taking care of them. Uh, the second thing is, is that, uh, you know, we're not really making any inroads. You guys have already laid out uh, the issues around young adults and why mm -hmm. they're not complying. And I had an op-ed piece uh, along with uh, Neil Kashkari, the uh, mm. president of the first uh, of the Federal Reserve Bank here in Minneapolis in the New York Times several weeks ago saying, you know, what we really need is not a lockdown. And at least in some areas where the virus is really hot, because it's the only way we actually beat the actual virus down. And other countries that did that, they didn't wait uh, and, and a release in Memorial Day time period, late May, like we did. They went through the summer. Right. They're in a much better economic position than we are right now, a much better position. And uh, and so you can say, well, but we can't stand under the lockdown. Psychologically, I understand that. But if we were taking care of people financially, and we laid out in this op-ed piece the fact that the savings rate in the U.S. has gone from 8 to 20 percent. And we could finance all of this out of American dollars, American investments, paying back Americans for borrowing their dollars. Not wouldn't have to borrow a one penny from another country. Wow. And we believe that that's really a great investment right now. So I would be willing to close down bars and restaurants and keep them whole, you know make it as if they were in business right and and then let it go so that we can get this thing tamped down new york has done that largely uh you know they a lot of people have suffered though because of it even financially uh but the qu the question is going to remain is, is as you just asked what will it be like a year from now well one a lot of places aren't going to be able to hold on we know that you know mm -hmm. this from your own work second of all though it's our hope and i tell you right now hope is not a strategy but it's our hope that in fact, we will see a, a great reduction in the transmission based on an effective vaccine and with the hope that there is some durable immunity, that it lasts for a while. We still have a global problem, which is going to take us a long time to get vaccines to 8 billion people. Right. And so in the travel industry, it's going to be a, a, a huge issue of how do we bring back travel? Uh, I, you know, I, I've said all along, I will know that it, I'm back when I can go back out and eat go to a play and take a train, a plane trip to someplace wonderful and lush that I want to go see. Uh, we like that sort of feeling. And we understand exactly the case that you're laying out. Um, in fact, for our hotel listeners out there, last month, 24% of hotel mortgages were not paid. That shows how serious this situation is. Uh, yeah. But doctor, we've got a great question regarding what you were talking about with travel. Do you foresee travel restrictions for people who do not have vaccines, let's just say a year from now? It could. I think that that surely could be a situation uh, that could be there. I, I would say right now, I worry very much about this thing called immune passports, where people are looking to see, do you have immunity from being tested for the antibody? Because we know that those tests can be unreliable. And again, we don't know quite what they mean. It's going to take us some time to understand that. Uh, it could be that someone will say, you know, you can come into our country uh, unfettered, do our re what you used to do if you have evidence of a vaccination or vaccines, in this case, two doses. We used to do that for things like smallpox and other diseases back when. Or maybe it's going to be more like now, if you don't have evidence of vaccine, you still have to quarantine for 14 days. 
before you're going to be able to move around, which makes, of course, travel much, much more difficult at that point. So I think this is part of where we're all learning. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? How will the world adjust? You know, what will we do if we have countries that are still on fire out there and the right. reason they're on fire is because we can't get vaccine to them because there's not enough yet. I think the global distribution of this vaccine will be huge. We will be remembered. Trust me, our grandkids, which will be reading about the pandemic of 2020, will one day say, well, grandpa, grandma, how come you let all these people around the world die because you wouldn't get vaccine to them because uh, they weren't you know, in a high or middle income mm -hmm. country status? We're going to have to deal with that. So we need to be certain that we have a global vaccine plan that works for the world. Right. Because if we don't have a global vaccine plan, then we might not as, might as well not have any plan, because unless everyone is taken care of, then we're all at risk. Well, you know, one of the things about infectious diseases, I tell people over and over again, you know, a germ anywhere in the world today can be everywhere tomorrow. And so, you know, we have to understand it's not just being altruistic. It surely is. But we right. need to take care of the whole world because with infectious diseases, they know nothing about borders. And that was surely borne out even in what happened in January uh, with this virus. And, you know, by China, you know, in China, this thing was all around the world before most people even woke up. Wow. So, so I have a question. Why this field of study? It's fascinating to hear you, the fascinating how your passion. What got you into this field of study? Personally, this would frighten me because that's all I would be thinking about is where's the next germ coming? What was the moment you said, I want to study germ? I want to study this. You know, I, I have uh, a, a, an interesting story in that regard. I was born and raised in small town Iowa. And uh, uh, at the time, I came from a family of some substantial dysfunction, uh, both a uh, father who was an alcoholic and abusive man. I was the oldest child, had to deal with that. But in the process of being raised in that town, um, I had the wonderful, wonderful opportunity to become very close to the wife of the newspaper owner of the where my father worked as a photographer. And she was, in essence, a Renaissance woman. She had her uh, advanced degree in, in journalism, uh, fluent in French, uh, and she subscribed to the New Yorker. I don't think anybody in my part of Iowa subscribed to the New Yorker, but her. Well, in the New Yorker magazine was a series of articles, basically, that were written by uh, a guy by the name of Burton Roger. And they were kind of medical whodunits. And so what he would do is take outbreaks that the CDC had worked on and kind of put them to story. And, and you know, real life sometimes is much better than fiction could ever be. And so I started reading these. Uh, I just happened to pick one up one day when I was at her home, and I was fascinated by what this, this Annals of Medicine article was about. And it was a whodunit, and I loved Sherlock Holmes. And so I started reading all of these. Whenever she would get done with her New Yorker, she'd call up, and I'd go <laughs> running up to her house as a sixth grader, seventh grader, and read these stories. I knew back in high school I wanted to become a medical detective. And it was all because of that. And the irony of all of this was the very last outbreak that Burton Roger wrote about in the New Yorker before he died was one that I led. And uh, wow. I had the opportunity to actually tell him what an inspiration he was in my life and that I was here only wow. because of him. And uh, it was an incredibly fortunate timing issue. But I owe my career to Burton Roger and all of his work uh, detailing those great medical whodunits. And that's well, what my you. life's been about. That's fascinating. And, and I hope young people are listening to that. Those moments are the moments you really got to listen to yourself and take and, and take that chance. Uh, uh, I actually ran the Algonquin Hotel in New York City, which um, basically uh, the gentleman that founded it, Kaufman, was part of the round table. So the New Yorker was actually found in the lobby of the Algonquin. I actually know that history a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, I've been there. I love that hotel. Yeah, it's one of my, it is my favorite. They're renovating it now, but they're keeping the cat, the round table, and the blue bar. Fantastic. So, um, oh. it, it is, it's a lot of writers uh, go to place. Uh, you know, the only thing I regret about that is I've actually been in there having a drink, and I've often envisioned what it would have been like to be back there those days when they would gather for their quote unquote, well, I think it was described once as, 
the, the most creative discussion in all of New York or something like that. Uh, uh, a, right. caravan, a caravan of captivating characters. Is that, that was it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That must have been a remarkable experience to have enjoyed you, that. You know what was great about that that hotel is yeah. um, I'm a kid from Brooklyn, right? Went to, went to public schools, uh, got my college degree in the Air Force. And I didn't really come from that world. I didn't understand that world. But I knew immediately when I walked through those doors and I was going to take over as general manager, I needed to become the historian. I needed to understand, um, but, you know, from from day one that hotel, and um, so yeah, I mean, the, and we actually had um, a lot of the cartoons from the New Yorker around the hotel for, yeah. for a period of time. So uh, it's being renovated. Hopefully, it'll come back bigger and better than ever. Uh, All right, so we've only got about ten minutes left. I got yep. an important uh, question up here. Um, uh, okay. Our friend Melissa Stone Sloan has a, a, a statement. Um, Hydroclox, uh, hydro, uh, I, I, I hydroxychloroquine. Sorry, yeah. it was approved there over you, forty you years it. ago, and it wasn't just forced or quickly approved by the FDA. She says, but uh, COVID nineteen was only found in, in two thousand, discovered last year. So, how do you? address that issue that people well, might think. hydroxychloroquine has been used for other conditions so it wasn't that it wasn't already approved it was this was a different application of using it for which there was real speculation why it might even work okay mm -hmm. you know it's like putting water in your gas tank and expecting it to work just as well if you put gas in um and so many of us were skeptical from the get-go but there were certain believers in this uh, product and what it would do and of course, the subsequent studies showed it had no uh, uh, impact in a positive way. And in fact, it put people at risk because of some of the cardiac disease that could occur by using the drug. But it is used for other purposes. And uh, that's why it has been approved and been around. Right. So it wasn't approved for that, um, for COVID until the FDA approved it for COVID. Right. And that was an, what we call an emergency youth authorization. So basically, emergency use only. Right, just, and, uh, but you need to still have data for that. And a lot of people raise serious challenges to say it never even rose high enough uh, in the evidence based uh, information to support its initial emergency use. So yeah. what does it seem what seems to be working now, at least in the critical care of these patients? Is there any, well, you know, yeah, you know, first of all, I, I you know, it, it gets even almost emotional for me to talk about the what has happened in our intensive care units around the country, or for that matter, around the world, um, it's been remarkable. Most people don't realize that over a thousand healthcare workers in this country have died from COVID-19. Wow. Now, not all of them died from in line of service, but there have been and many who have. And, uh, you know, what's happened from the very first days of house on fire, particularly in New York and places like that, intensive care physicians and nurses have learned so much about how to provide better care to these patients. It's not about one drug. It's how they use ventilation, you know, mechanical ventilator, uh, how they use other kinds of basic immune suppressive drugs. And uh, they have done a remarkable job of bringing down the death rate from just good medical care. There are basically two drugs now that are, are two applications that emergency use authorization is for. One is for remdesivir. Remdesivir is uh, a, a basically a drug that uh, has some antiviral characteristics. It's one that at best is maybe some, uh, I wouldn't say it's more than marginal potentially benefit, but not clear. And then of course the plasma, concentrated plasma, which is taking antibodies from the people who have recovered. Right. So it take the blood from them, take the antibody out. That too has had mixed results. Uh, uh, that received emergency use authorization very recently, and some were very upset about that, saying that the data did not uh, uh, support its right. use so, like that. Doctor, in, in that same vein, to have you continue, um, Nick Commons, one of our listeners, I believe he's out of Australia, um, said, do you have any knowledge on the Australian-made antibodies that have been found to kill COVID in its tracks? It's not a vaccine, but a remedy for the very sick. It yeah. sounds to me that's what you were just talking about. Actually, I'm not. I think okay. if I understand him correctly, it's in the same order of effect. But what it is, is called monoclonal antibodies, where they're actually mm -hmm. made in the lab. And rather than trying to take the plasma from somebody who's recovered, which may have various levels of the kind of really most protective antibody, monoclonal antibodies are literally engineered in the lab and produced in large quantities. And they are high quality antibodies, and you can actually 
uh, determine how much you want to give, meaning you can 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 put in a certain amount in every time uh, into the, into the patient. And so that's I think what he's asking, and that that too is being studied right now, monoclonal antibodies uh, and just how effective they might be. Right, that makes sense. Anthony, you got another question, sir? Oh, I got a whole bunch of questions. I figured. What happens next? Is there, are, you, are there maybe a different strain that we won't have a vaccine for? You know, I'm, I'm thinking a year from now when things are getting a little bit back to normal, hopefully, but then all of a sudden we get hit with something else. Um, yeah. What keeps you up at night? I imagine a lot of things, but what's the thing that keeps you up at night the most? You know, as bad as this pandemic is, and I surely don't want to minimize it, you know, all those numbers we keep talking about are real people. There are loved ones. There yeah. are people who mean something to us. And I think sometimes it becomes too easy to get callous just on numbers. And I never, I never, never forget the faces and the loved ones behind that. So don't let me minimize this pandemic in that regard. But at the same time, let me remind everyone, I don't think this is the big one. The big one surely could be a 1918 like influenza pandemic uh, where the primary uh, risk uh, group for dying were actually young, healthy adults. And, uh, you know, as much as we see the increased number of deaths here, it doesn't compare to what a 1918 like pandemic could occur. Wow. Today, we are ripe for one of these. Uh, you know, influenza pandemics will not stop because a COVID pandemic has occurred. Uh, and all it takes is a virus to emerge out of the animal kingdom. Primarily, most people don't realize that today, the number one bird in terms of, of population in the world today is the chicken. There are over 20 right. billion chickens on the face of the earth because we use them to, it's the greatest uh, conversion of energy to protein we have for the food source. But that's exactly where this virus resides as a bird virus. And then if you get enough of it and over time, it gets into pigs where they have an uh, ability to get infected with both bird viruses and human viruses, or it gets directly into a human and changes enough with human infection that then it becomes the new pandemic virus. Um, this is the one that scares me. It, uh, it surely could, could make this one seem not nearly as severe as it is. And Jeez. right now, I think we all agree this uh, is a whole uh, yeah, In your was... estimation, just so I can sleep tonight, this isn't going to happen for another 500,000 years, right? Uh, this could be happening at this very moment that you and I are talking. There's no reason because one pandemic is happening and another one can't. At the same time, you, you know, maybe days, weeks, I don't know. Uh, but I can tell you, it is going to happen. There have been 10 influenza pandemics in the last 250 years. There's going to be more in the future. This is why we have to do a much better job of preparing. We should not have been surprised. Our center declared this was going to be a pandemic on January 20th. We put it out publicly uh, weeks before governments did. Mm -hmm. And we had so much we could have done to be better prepared just then. But now we understand it's not just waiting till the virus arrives. Uh, why would you only have 35 million respirators or the masks in your stockpile when you know a single hospital in New York can use 2 million a day? You right. know, it's, it's, it's that kind of challenge that we have. We have to be much better prepared and we yeah. can. Yeah. I yeah. would, with a, I, I have a very close friend of mine who's an anesthesiologist and he was on the front lines in the New York hospitals. And I was basically every day he, him and I would, would talk because yeah. he got home, he needed a place because his family's away and he needed a place to kind of talk. So we would get on the phone and we would talk yeah. and I didn't have to read the newspapers. I mean, matter of fact, I didn't read newspapers for 52 days. I didn't read any news. Yeah. I, didn't hear any yeah. news. Yeah. I had a blackout because all I needed to hear was his voice. And um, he was in the beginning, he was washing out his mask. Uh, and yeah. he, Crazy. I, I asked him, I said, you know, you seem really kind of, you know, terrified and he goes i'm not terrified he goes i'll go in and do my job he goes and i'll, I'll do go in there like a rock star and do my job i have no problem with that it's but i'm going in with a thin sheet of paper and that's right yeah and you know the thing i remember and i'm sure you do too is uh you know i here being in minneapolis uh we're on a lot of phone calls with people in new york during that time period and you could never get the sirens out of the background no 24 7. we, we, we unfortunately um i'm 20 feet away from a house that um, a good friend of ours, uh, one of my dearest friends, 70, 78 years old, Ed Antonio passed away. And it was, it was, April, it was April 4th. And he was like a surrogate father to me. And I, I didn't call him father. And uh, it was frightening. It was absolutely frightening. Yeah. And he was yeah. on, I think he was on that drug we were talking about. Um, yeah. And, yeah. He had, and he had some blood clotting issues and stuff. 
Now, that's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to talk about his his stuff, but yeah. it was it was it, like you said, it hits close to home for everyone. It does, um, and it's gonna. You know, I said this uh, uh, months ago that you know, in this country today, as divided as we are in so many issues, and we talk about red states and blue states, or red counties and blue counties. By the time this is all over with, there won't be any red or blue. They'll all be COVID colored, and we have to right. understand that. Right. So. Absolutely. A couple of a uh, couple more questions for you. One. Yeah. Uh, do you recommend antibody testing for the purpose of plasma donation? I know there are inaccuracies on antibody testing, but is it helpful? If and then I have a question about flu. clinical disease and you've been diagnosed, then yes, then you can uh, do that for purposes of donating plasma. Excellent. And I just got my flu shot this week. I'm very, very focused on getting that every year. This year I got right. it earlier. I've been hearing medical professionals saying more than ever this year is important. Why is it more important this year than other years? Because the flu shot is not a COVID shot. Well, first of all, it, you're right. It won't uh, impact whether you get COVID or not. But uh, if we have a bad COVID fall in winter, which I think we surely could, uh, the last thing you want to do is get really sick with flu and need to be have the have those same hospital uh, uh, availability and beds, uh, you know, expertise, medications that the COVID patients are also going to be using. This is not a good time to get hospitalized for flu. So also it would surely help hold down the number of people hospitalized so we could allocate more to, to the people with COVID. So yeah, get your flu shot. Uh, I urge it. Um, you know, it may only be 50% effective, but you know what? That's a lot better than zero. And so I urge you all to get a flu shot. Absolutely. Last official Good. question for you before we uh, ask you for some final advice. With so many sources of information out there, what is the best source in your opinion for the facts on COVID-19, and I'm gonna add on a continuing basis. Uh, you know, this is gonna sound very self-serving, but since there's nothing in it financially for us, you know, we maintain a comprehensive website at our center, the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. It's called CIDRAP, C-I-D-R-A-P. And the, w -W and the URL is www.sidrap.umn.edu, like the University of Minnesota. E e and it's all free. And we keep it updated every day. We have a very active news team. Uh, it's comprehensive and you can go in and find things from all over the world. We take the best of whether it's WHO or CDC or any other organization and put it there. So, you know, and, and our, our job has always been just calls, balls and strikes. You know, we're not politically oriented. Uh, you know, just tell it like it is. I hope you sensed I did today. And so I'd say that's one good source and it's a comprehensive source. It's kind of a, a, a big search engine, you might say, of all the information that's out there. Yeah, I think that's uh, really important that we uh, we listen to the facts from a person like you who has been very clear and, in my opinion, not focused on politics. You're focused on saving lives. Anthony, any final questions before we let the good doctor go? Just again, thank you so much for being here. And thank you. you. Cleared up a lot of uh, questions I had. And um, I know our audience truly appreciated by all the comments they made. So thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, doctor. Thank you. Love to have appreciate you on. It. Sure. It's, and it's Mike. It's Mike. Okay. All right. In that case, thank, thank you, Mike. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Really appreciate right. you. Thank, thank you, you so you much. Right. Wow. I mean, I know I say that a lot, but this time, wow. I hope what great mic. information. I hope he just dropped his mic and walked out. He was. Oh, he, he totally. He totally did. I I saw the virtual mic drop. He's already out of the uh, the green room. Yeah. And, and he, um, you know, and he talks about this all the time. And you know, one of the things I I can't imagine for someone like him is not to talk politics, but to talk politics for a second. Mm -hmm. is how frustrated he must be because of the politics because the politics is like you know when you're going down you know a street and you're like okay i got five minutes to get to that appointment i'm a minute away i'm good and all of a sudden a garbage truck kind of comes out of nowhere and now you're stuck and now now you have like an hour before you can get your appointment that's, <laughs> I, that's happened to me <laughs> that's what politics does to to this covid it's like we're getting this information out people are kind of banding together and then all of a sudden the garbage truck gets in the middle and it's like no 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 you're not going anywhere. You're, you're not going to listen to real factual information. It's it's crazy. So um, I'm I, I'm actually the doctor, and Glenn is not. But that's okay. <laughs> um, fascinating, a fascinating individual. And and I'm so glad I asked this story about why did you decide to chase the germs? And then that isn't that such an inspiring story? It's amazing. And we all have one, right? And even yeah. doctor at his level has this great inspiring story. Yep, absolutely. What a 
overall, I think that we could look at this in several ways. Number one, I think the goal of today was to help educate and inform you on what we can all do to get our economy going by making sure everybody's safe. But also, hopefully a little bit of inspiration that you could see, you know, what you could accomplish if you set your mind to it. What an incredible professional. And, and if I, I never asked this, but if everyone listening, can you please share this with everyone? Like yes. this should be, this should be the most shared podcast we've ever done. The most shared live we've ever done. Um, so I think it's really, really important to really listen to him and listen, if you listen to him and you take politics out of this and you're like, Oh, he's this or he's that then stop listening to us, period, because this man was so um, uh, informative and so non-political that if you think he was political and didn't like him, I, I'm asking you not to listen to us anymore. Because and I'm uh, asking you to please continue to listen to us because we, we love having you here. <laughs> that was the most informative piece of information I've had in a long time. So, um, Glenn, um, what's going on with our show? Where are we going next week? All right. So starting on Tuesday next week, we should be going on a single stream on Anthony's uh, Facebook page. But it'll also, the same exact stream should be on the, uh, the No Vacancy live feed. I'm just working on the last details of that. So please check us there. We will try to share that stream on LinkedIn, but to get it directly, go to Facebook. You should still be able to see a link, but it'll be a little bit differently when you go to the LinkedIn page. Right. So, Joe, so just so you understand, if you're coming at LinkedIn at 12 o'clock on Tuesday, the link will be there, but it will just, it'll be like a detour. It'll take you to, it'll right. take you to the Facebook live page, but it will be there. Our producer, David, promised us that it will be there. I can't actually bring him up because I don't have control of it, but I was going to bring him I up. Could, I could bring him up. Let's bring, bring him, him in. Up. He did, he did you know, wash his hair today. Yeah. You look pretty today, Dave. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. So, so um, you're going to, you're going to make that promise, right? That the link will be everywhere. The link will be everywhere. I'm going to get everything set up. So as soon as we go live, uh, I'll grab that link from Facebook and pop it over on your guys' channel. So anybody that's still on LinkedIn could just click on that link and uh, easily access the show. And since you were critical in getting Dr. Uh, Dr. Mike, I'll call him, on the on, 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 on the podcast, I want to thank you. And also, what did you learn from him? What did you think about it? I thought, as you said, this is one of our most informative interviews I think we've ever had. And it was nice to step out of our kind of comfort zone, right? This is something we haven't really touched on before. And I think getting the facts, right? Because there's so much information always coming out there through different news sources, through social media. And it's a lot of it is biased, unfortunately, by politics. So to really just hear from an expert the facts and what he as a foremost leader in his field knows just you can't beat it. You just can't right. beat hearing from the source. I, I agree. Thank you. All right. Put him away now. <laughs> yeah. All right. See you later, Dave. Thanks so much. Have a great holiday weekend, buddy. Thank you. All right. So Robert Marks has shared the feed. What about the rest of you folks uh, out there that are still watching right now? I'll tell you, go Robert ahead. And I, Robert's a friend of mine and Robert and I, oh. Robert, <laughs> Robert uh, is a concierge and, 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 and um, uh, we had a really good conversation. I will tell you, Robert, uh, I think I can share this, um, but he is in the test group for one of the vaccines. No, so, cool. Uh, we're we're indebted to you, and um, you know, fifty years when you're telling stories to to your family, you can tell them that you were on the front lines of this vaccine, and we appreciate it. We appreciate you putting yourself out there, um, uh, and you're one of my favorite people. So thank you very much. I truly appreciate, it. and I really enjoyed our conversation. So what are you doing this weekend? Don't talk about pork butts. <laughs> All right. I won't talk about pork butts. Uh, I'm having some of my uh, closest uh, friends and their family over, and we are going to be making Mediterranean food. What happened to your rib? Oh, uh, I got burned. How? Uh, pork butt. I, no, no. Uh, less less exciting than a good pork butt story. Uh, I love French press coffee. I don't like drip coffee. French press coffee is so much better. We invested, oh, in, yeah, a new, yeah. we invested in a new one. The damn thing loves puking up every single time. Uh, the other day, it puked up on my arm, and I got a uh, pretty serious uh, burn on Wednesday. Are you going to be okay? I expect to. Okay. You know, right. I, I'll heal. And, and, and I'm going to tell people about uh, our fight. Can I tell people about our fight? Because people really care about our fight. I think they I think they do. Let's peel back the onions and see what's going on behind the scenes at No Vacancy so, Live. So, so as everyone knows, I jump on this show a few minutes before. You know, we're all busy. And, and uh, one of the things I love about um, – Everything I get to do is really I kind of come to things outside of my keynotes with very little preparation because I like asking questions. So but with this, I really felt that we needed or we all felt that we needed to kind of be a little prepared to not waste the doctor's time or ask him any stupid questions. So 
uh, we were preparing a little bit before the show and Glenn asked a question and he asked it in a negative tone, just like he said, he's going to ask this question. And I go, just don't ask it in a negative tone. And, um, Glenn said something like, I have 300,000 years of experience on how to ask questions. I don't need you to tell me how to ask questions. <laughs> right, right. I did say that, something along the lines of that. But we did uh, we did get it amped up a little bit more before I had to uh, had to come back with uh, with that one. Uh, but that's why we keep it authentic, Anthony. But, but that's but it, like when you talk about partnerships and I, listen, I, I said it and I and, and and I always try to get close to the nerve because I always want to test our relationship and our uh, partnership and our friendship. I hit the nerve uh, i'm glad i hit the nerve i will hit it again of I'm course back off of it but that's what when you have a good partner whether it be my my partner jeremy or my you, you and my partner is is that you've got to have you know i had a conversation i feel comfortable with you i just said it and i knew it might piss you off and i didn't care yeah. because i knew you'd be okay with it and i would be able to explain myself and i may do it again and maybe you'll do it again and when so so anytime you go into business with somebody anytime you start a podcast with somebody make sure you're really comfortable that you can even piss them off once in a while and <laughs> remember that sometimes the way you talk before the mics get turned on and the way that you communicate with the audience after they're turned on can be completely different, but still have the same goal. Okay, mind. so so basically what you're saying is, Anthony, uh, have you ever heard me say that on Facebook? <laughs> and I said, I actually did. And he goes, can you prove that? And I go, no, I can't prove it because I'm not going to go back and watch 100 shows. Uh, <laughs> but the reason I bring this up, I, the reason I bring this up is, you know, if I've had any success in my life, right, is really being around people that make me better and people I really respect. And any uh, any criticism of me has been I really kind of discount people pretty quick. Um, I'm just like, once they start screwing up or I don't get along with them, I kind of don't waste my time. And that has been a, probably an accurate description. And unfortunately I'm getting better at that. But when you do find someone you're comfortable with, you are going to get into arguments and you're yeah. going to get into disagreements and it's okay. As long as they're the right person. I think my window guy's here. So I got to go. All right. But just say one thing, the longer that we've known each other, the more we fight because the more we love each other. Have a great <laughs> holiday weekend. Yeah, we don't fight. All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. And uh, remember, guys, you've got one life, so blaze on and be kind to yourself. We're taking Labor Day off Monday. See